subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everyone. Over the last few days, a lot of the initial uncertainties about the COVID pandemic seem to have returned with Omicron. My guest today is a clinical physician who brought Omicron to the notice of the world. Dr. Angelic Koedzi has been seeing patients for 33 years and she's also the chairperson of the South African Medical Association. She's on several advisory boards of, on COVID. Uh, welcome, Dr. Koedzi. Great to have you on our show. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show and it's an honor to show um, to share our knowledge with all the people out there. So I will I will start off with the question that's on everybody's minds. Um, you've seen you've seen thousands of cases right now. It seems I think the last count was eleven thousand five hundred in a single day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you know, it's it's been two weeks. What has what more can you tell us about Omicron? What have you learned about uh, the uh, variant so far? Thank you for asking that question. It's a very important question. So what we have learned. Um, is the following. First of all, it is quite transmissible. Would it be more than Delta? We don't know. We still need to see what um, the, um, the curve, the top of the curve would be. Um, yes, it is fast spreading, but it's not to say it will be faster in the end of the day than, uh, or, or, or in fact, more people in the end of the day than Delta. We will have to see. We know that we can, you can um, make the diagnose on a PCR test. That's that test that you swap through the nose and the throat. We also know that you can test on uh, the rapid tests um, with between one and five days after starting with symptoms. Um, we know that in the primary healthcare setup, majority of cases are minor, um, minor or mild. Um, it does not take away that if you have a headache and the body ache and pain um, and the fatigue that it's, that it's not severe, uh, it's very intense. So, but it's not no need for um, hospitalization. We also know that so far, primary healthcare level, where the majority of these patients are seen, no oxygen is needed. We also know that currently our hospitals are not overflowed. Um, and there's not enough beds. Yes, there is a slight, starting to get a slight increase in hospital numbers um, going forward. And we know that in the beginning of any wave, children will always be the first that's affected and the younger people. As any um, uh, uh, of these uh, Variants progress through their wave. Uh, your elderly and your um, patients who have a lot of uh, chronic diseases, they will then start to get sick, and then we will know exactly how many severe cases are there. For now, yes, there are people who are being admitted in the public sector and private sector hospital with only COVID symptoms, whether it's Delta, whether it's Omicron. That's not we're not sure about that. So we have now asked that those. Um, stats being released so that we can um, have a better picture. Although the children, because there's a, high, a huge hype in South Africa now about the children, it's important to say that because we haven't seen in the, during the winter a lot of flu cases, now with the rains that we had last week and the week beforehand, so there's a lot of children with flu or respiratory tract infections, normal tonsillitis, normal diarrhea coming in, but then test positive for COVID. So, so the impression is that there's a lot of COVID children being admitted, which is not true. It's, it's a, but there are definitely children admitted for COVID, but the majority is a, um, a, a incidental finding because we test each and every person going into hospital. I just want to make that clear because there's a huge hype out there that children is severely affected. Right. I, I'll come to that hype part in a bit. But before that, when you say mild disease, uh, you know, not, not, not very severe and all that, are you saying that for vaccinated individuals, unvaccinated individuals? Um, good, right. Great question. So, so I'm so glad that I can share this now because up until around about Thursday last week, this was not very clear, but now the, the picture is starting to, to, to get more clearer. So what we see is that your vaccinated person will remember everyone's symptoms are more or less the same. It's the, the body ache and pain, um, the sore body, the headache, they've got a, quite a, a severe headache, and then the tiredness that's, that, that goes with it, with sometimes the throat that's sore, or sometimes just a bit of a post-nasal drip. But the difference is, 
the unvaccinated person will have, I call it the mother of all headaches and, mm -hmm. and body ache and pain, while your vaccinated person will have a headache and it will have body ache and pain, but not as a, intense than the unvaccinated people. That is, this is only recently that we that I started to, to see this picture coming clearer. And, and what it tells me is that yes, um, although you are vaccinated and you get an infection, your intensity of the symptoms are not as, as not as the severe as the unvaccinated person. And then also what we have now starting to notice is that you take about two days or so, three days max, and you get much better, especially if you use a bit of cortisone and, um, and ibuprofen and panado. That works very, very well. But the unvaccinated it takes a bit longer. Right. Um so talking about hype, you know, your announcement has caused a bit of a global panic. Um, what What is your take on that? The, re the response to your, did you expect that kind of a response? No, we never expected that kind of response. And remember, our scientists were very clear um, when they announced it to the world to say, listen, this is newly, um, newly picked up or discovered. We still, there's still all the questions. Um, and we still need to answer that question. So what should have been um, actually happening, um, you know, if on a political level is um, immediately there should have been, yes, there's 30, more than 30 mutations. It is a, a viral, in fact, or, or a variant of concern. But let's go back to the basics. The basics is getting people to wear clean masks on a daily basis, stay away from groups of people and get yourself vaccinated to get you boosted. That is much more productive than mm -hmm. just to go and slam South Africa with a travel ban. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's in any case in everyone's country. We, we told them it's going to be in everyone's country. I said it right from the beginning. You cannot stop the virus to, to travel. It's going to travel. Right. That's how it's good. Right. So, I, in fact, that was my next question, that what do you think of these uh, travel bans? I mean, you, you don't think they'll work, right? You clearly don't think they'll work. No. It's not going to work. You got, so you, that's a false sense of security. The other problem that you have with, with testing before, let's say, uh, remember now with Omicron, it's mild symptoms. So, so, so it's so easy to, to, to miss a patient with, uh, you know, I've got a sore body, my, my muscles, and I've got a slight headache, doctor, just not feeling well. Um, you, it's very easy to miss that because they're not acutely sick. So now I want to travel to China or to, to India, so I do my PCR test. Remember, I do it too early. Can't pick it up. And then two days later, when I'm finally in India, then it's positive. I didn't got it on the, on the flight. I actually had it before. Right. And then when I, when, I, when I disembark in India, I still have mild symptoms. It's still not in my head that I have uh, Omicron because no one told me about the symptoms and no one made me aware of it. Right. And that's why I was going to spread it. That's exactly what happened with our, uh, pay, uh, I mean, the, our first case. Uh, he tested himself in South Africa. He was fine. He came here and then he tested positive and all that. That's exactly how it happened. So, uh, you know, South Africa current levels of vaccination are quite low. Is that, is, is that the reason why such a severely mutated vaccine may have emerged? So we're not sure whether it actually emerged in South Africa, where it's where it where, where the origins um, we where it originated from. We were just um, out of our uh, third wave for at least uh, about two months, and um, you know, so so when when the symptoms start to appear, it was quite easy to see that it, this is not Delta. Um, you know, Delta. I think Delta for me is a very very serious. Um, viral infection to get Delta, um, you know, if you've seen Delta and if you've um, uh, uh, treated a lot of patients, I think I understand why everyone's up in arms because you, you saw Delta and then you saw 30 mu more mutations and you just go panic, 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 panic. And um, instead of just wait and see what is transferring from this virus, what is it going to do? So, um, yeah, it is a, 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 it's a very interesting uh, picture and, 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 and evolving of the symptoms as we, we carry on. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
What I don't think I've answered your question correctly. I think I missed some part of your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, so I was actually asking if the low vaccination numbers could have caused the mutation, but you're saying that mutation, it's possible that it did not actually, the actual act of mutation didn't happen. You just picked it up. So, yes. So, yeah. so, so to come back to the vaccines, you have to understand South Africa only started around about um, May with um, vac vaccines um, being administered to um, our people. So for now, um, the above 60s, more than 65% are mm -hmm. vaccinated. So, but um, the, the younger people and the 12 years and up, there's not a high uptake. We would love to see much more mm -hmm. people getting vaccinated. Um, and then interesting enough, I don't think there's so much anti-vaccinists out there as that people are just don't, you know, they don't have the time to go or um, they want to go and, and, and then something happens or, you know, there's a lot of reasons. But I don't think it, it is that much as anti-vax, a, a pure anti-vax attitude. It's just, I call it just lazy. There's not enough time. Right. So 65% is single dose or double dose? Pfizer is a, as a double dose, but we are now going. We're waiting for our Minister of Health to announce that they would be hopefully between, either between um, above the age of 50 or above the age of 60, booster vaccines um, can becoming available. We hope that would be within the next week or two mm -hmm. so that we can get uh, uh, booster vaccines. Because um, interesting enough, the Pfizer breakthrough infections that we are seeing, mm -hmm. it's those people mostly uh, vaccinated with their last um, Pfizer um, around about uh, between uh, July, end of July, as well as up until um, uh, uh, October, end of October. So very interesting. So uh, you, because we ask every patient coming in, you ask when was, have you been vaccinated? Have you been fully vaccinated? And when was your last dosage? And if they're not vaccinated, we ask why, you know, is there a specific reason why you, you're you not vaccinated? And it's not really a, a tangible reason that we can say, they are anti-vaxxers and therefore we need to do ABCD. It's that type of thing, doctor, I want to go. I haven't had time. It's on my list. You know, um, I'm not sure. Can I go and vaccinate because I have diabetes? Yes, yes, you have to go and vaccinate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you seeing more breakthroughs in Pfizer or, or, or is, is that the only vaccine that's currently being used in South Africa? Uh, no, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. For now, um, we see more breakthrough infections with Pfizer. But remember, more people have been vaccinated as well with Pfizer. Right. So it might be because more people and not so many with Johnson & Johnson. Um, the healthcare workers has predominantly been vaccinated since uh, February this year. With, um, because we try to protect them with um, Johnson & Johnson. And um, with the third wave, we saw breakthrough infections. That's when we start to pick up these breakthrough infections on the healthcare workers. Um, not again, uh, even it, though it was Delta, uh, uh, they were again se less severe. Uh, yes, there's unfortunately doctors that died from after they've been vaccinated with Johnson Johnson, but it's really, I don't know if whether it's even five doctors. So, but there are people. So, I just need to say, that I can't say no one has died after they've been vaccinated, but. For now, um, we are aware that there are breakthrough infections in some of these um, the private sector hospitals. But again, from Omicron, it seems that they are mild. Is there a timeline? So, uh, is there a so so I can understand Pfizer more people vaccinated more breakthrough. But is there a timeline where you're seeing after six months, after uh, two months, whatever? Can you can you say anything about that? So, so the, the, uh, let me just see, today, I think I got, yeah. Today I saw a 33-year-old th uh, man, 36, sorry, 36-year-old man that has been vaccinated with Pfizer in October with a, bra with a breakthrough infection. Not severe disease, but he's got it. Um, and I saw my last patient this, before uh, this interview was a 36-year-old male that had Johnson & Johnson in March. Oh, so there's not really any pattern in particular, right? Right, yeah. right. But um, what? How, how important are booster doses in this circumstance? 
I think it's it's going to be important. Um, I I do. I, I, I saw my oldest patient that has been vaccinated is an 82 year old lady with Pfizer. So um, she, but again, you know, we didn't even follow her up normally with Delta. She would have been um, really, really um, a, a patient of concern to us. She, you know, with the age group, all her comorbidities that she had, or all her chronic disease, she would have been. Um, one of the people that we would have looked very, very carefully after and keep on letting them come back into the surgery to make sure that you, you um, can assist them when oxygen is needed. But uh, she was fine as well. Right. Uh, for, if if, if, if I, I sort of try to pick your brains on, on what we should be doing, we, we, we have had a few cases so far uh, still, still in the low double digits. Um, we have about 85% of the population which has one dose of at least some vaccine and um, about 50% fully vaccinated. Uh, in, in these circumstances, um, should, we, should we sort of continue to vaccinate the people that we are already vaccinating? That's adults. We are not vaccinating children anymore uh, uh, yet. Sorry, we are not vaccinating children yet. Um, in these circumstances, should we go forward in the path that we have taken or should we push for boosters, especially for healthcare workers who probably got their second shot sometime in February, March? I, for, from our experience, there's two groups. Again, I would make sure that uh, I get as much jabs in the arms, especially of the 50 pluses. Whether it's a booster or whether it's the first one, I would I would try to because that's the 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 the, the population or the age group that will um, be responsible for higher um, admission rates, and then I will definitely um, protect my healthcare workers because if if they get sick, it's ten days of work. Whether it's mild, whether well severe, it should be uh, might be longer. But you can't afford to lose a healthcare worker. There's not enough, maybe in your country, but in our country, there's not enough. We have to. And then I will start pushing for the rest of the, the, the communities to get all age groups. And, and I would also try to push for people who has, um, you know, under the age of 50, who has a, a lot of comorbidity, chronic diseases that might render them a higher risk or people severely overweight. Um, if I haven't had been vaccinated, get them in. But I would not just go and ask for boosters. I would, I would, I, I would play every, every, all the cards that I have simultaneously. Right. Uh, you mentioned uh, children being affected. Uh, are you are you vaccinating children yet in South Africa? Up and up till about the age of twelve, mm -hmm. are being vaccinated, and uh, and unfortunately again. Uh, there's not that high. We would have loved to see more children um, between 12 and 17 to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the uptake is not um, that, that great. Uh, it could have been much, much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, remember, that's a difficult age group. They've got their own ideas. They, um, they don't need to have their parents' permission. Sometimes the parents would influence them to say, no, you don't go, I don't, don't know what's going to happen to you. I think the risk of the, the scare of the myocarditis is quite um, something that, that keeps on coming up in the conversations. Of what if my child is going to get a, that myocarditis, that inflammation of the heart? Yeah. Um, and the more we tell them, you know, it's about one out of a thousand, a hundred thousand, if it's that much. And if you're not vaccinated and you get um, COVID, you've got a 45 out of 100,000 chance. Um, doesn't make sense to them. It's just that thing about the heart. I, I think there's something about people's hearts that they are so afraid that something is going to happen to my child's heart. Absolutely. And is Omicron behaving any differently in children um, vaccinated, unvaccinated? Good question. What we have seen with the children is... Uh, they will. They are the ones that will say to you, um, "I've got a sore throat. My throat is really, really sore, and um, and I've, I, I don't feel okay. I've got a, you know." They will say, "I've got a headache," but you know, by now I know that the headache is going. You know, sometimes I can't word it correctly, and they they will present with a, lo a low grade fever, and interesting enough, I will see them with a, a fast pulse rate or an elevated pulse rate. 
But again, um, from when you make the diagnosis, around about three days later, mm -hmm. they are playing outside there. And, you know, it seems as three days ago, that child was really quite sick. Mm -hmm. And they, they actually recover quite fast. I'm not saying all the children, don't get me wrong. But the majority of what we have seen, that's the picture. Right. And these are, again, same question. These are unvaccinated children? Yes, they will be unvaccinated because we don't vaccinate them. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I, I know you have to rush to another patient. So uh, thank you so much for sparing the time, Dr. Koetzi. It was great yeah. having you. Thank you. It's only a pleasure if we can get the message out there. And please, again, one other important message is, please, if you, if you think you've got, uh, you wake up this morning or you went to bed last night with a severe headache, that body is sore and you wake up and it's still sore. It's not so much joint pains. It's more in the, in the muscle type of pain. And you just feel tired and under the weather. No sore throat, no running nose. Please go and get tested because that might be COVID Omnicron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to love and leave you. Thank you. Bye.